influenced by the people in SNCC, and especially by Bob Moses, whom I didn't meet for another two or three decades. But he was legendary, and he left such a wonderful sense of how one could serve the community. Uh, so I went on to school, and my, my, my dream was to be able to help the people who were like my own parents and like my grandparents. And so I, in the summers, I went to uh, register voters in little towns in Georgia, and then later I, I lived in Mississippi doing the same work for about uh, seven years. So it was, it was because I, I truly, deeply appreciated my, my own people and my own culture and my parents and grandparents above all, and I saw how hard they worked and how little they received in return of, of, of money or kindness. And I wanted very much to change uh, the South for them. You were, you first got married to a white man, an interracial marriage in a time in Mississippi that it was illegal. Uh, yes, but that just happened uh, because we fell in love. We, we, we did not go to Mississippi to meet. We, we went to Mississippi to work uh, for black people. And if he were not there working for black people and our freedom, I would not have met him nor, nor married him. Uh, it's very interesting today in uh, news headlines. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the headline of the uh, newspaper in Mississippi uh, that apologized, the Meridian Star published an apology for its past coverage of civil rights issues, an editorial reading in part, quote, there was a time when this newspaper and many others across the South acted with gross neglect by largely ignoring the unfairness of segregated schools, buses, restaurants, washrooms, theaters, and other public places. We did it through omission by not recording for our readers many of the most important civil rights activities that happened in our midst, including protests and sit-ins. Your thoughts, Alice? Well, uh, yes, and I'm 40 years is a, is a long time, and it's good to have a, an apology, uh, and I hope other newspapers will pay attention, because when newspapers and other media do not cover what is happening in people's lives, when people are struggling and suffering, it means a lot of danger, a lot more danger, a lot more despair, a lot more death. And I remember in Mississippi often feeling that we were working very hard and nobody was paying attention, and this was quite demoralizing. And that is when it was really wonderful to have our churches, because people could gather together there and sing and pray and look each other in the eye and say, yes, we know we're in danger, but we're going to keep going on. We're going to break and then come back to our guest, Bob Moses, legendary civil rights leader in studio in Boston, Alice Walker, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, poet, activist here in Washington, D.C., where a stone's throw from the Capitol in just a few hours, Barack Obama will become the 44th president of the United States. Stay with us. Keep on beating.
Higher ground, an amazing moment in front of the Lincoln Memorial on Sunday, mm. sung by Stevie Wonder, Usher, mm. and Shakira, mm. joining together these uh, formidable forces, mm. uh, singing before hundreds of thousands of people for the pre-inaugural concert, stretching from the Lincoln Memorial, which one it was de dedicated, by the way, I think it was 1922. It was dedicated before a segregated audience. <laughs> The Lincoln Memorial, the singers, the Obamas in the front row, along with the Bidens, and hundreds of thousands of people later, the Washington Monument. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, on this historic day, on the day that the first African-American president will be inaugurated, the 44th president of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by the Pulitzer Prize-winning author, poet, activist, Alice Walker, here in Washington, D.C. She'll be joining us throughout our live coverage of the inauguration. Joining us from Boston is Bob Moses, who is a civil rights hero, a legend, an icon, a leader in the civil rights movement. Bob, uh, Alice talked about knowing you then, but actually not meeting you for decades later. Can you take us from 1964, the voting, the battle for voting and civil rights, to what you see happening today, to the progress and also mm. warnings that you have for us or suggestions, recommendations? So my main uh, idea, I, I, I try to look at this uh, event in, through the lens of the evolution in this country of the idea of who in our country are the people who have constitutional rights and constitutional responsibilities and the evolution of the expansion of that. And um, I think the country kind of moves in uh, cycles which take uh, roughly around three quarters of a century. So I look at the time from 1787 until the Civil War as a time in which we had, yes, constitutional people, uh, mostly white men, but then we had constitutional property, African Americans who were slaves. And then we had this uh, horrendous war, 600,000 people are, are uh, killed during the war. And we come out of the war, uh, and Lincoln, whom Obama is uh, rightly um, looking at, uh, we get rid of the idea of constitutional property. But um, African Americans don't quite become full fledged uh, citizens. And uh, when we were in Mississippi, uh, people all the time were saying, well, we want to be first-class citizens. Um, and so the implication being that they were second or even third-class citizens. So the civil rights movement, and, and here I have to, I think we have to give uh, credibility to the sit-in movement, to the young black students at the historically black colleges who uh, really dismantled Jim Crow in the area of its public accommodations with the sit-in movement, um, they actually uh, dismantled that aspect of Jim Crow. So then there was this dismantling of it around the right to vote, and what I was talking about earlier also around the national uh, party structure. But you know, when I was uh, sitting in the federal district courthouse, I was uh, uh, in the witness stand. And if you remember, this was in the spring of 1963, and at that time President Kennedy was still alive, Bobby Kennedy was Attorney General, Burke Marshall was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and John Doe was my lawyer. He was their chief litigator uh, in the field. And the judge, uh, Judge Clayton, who was a federal district uh, judge, we had taken hundreds of sharecroppers in Greenwood to register, and then subsequently the SNCC field secretaries had been arrested. And Burke had our cases removed to the federal courts. So uh, Judge Clayton uh, looks over, and he wants to know, why are we taking illiterates down to register to vote? 
And so, in a nutshell, our answer is, well, the country can't have its cake and eat it, too. It can't have denied um, a whole people access to literacy through its political arrangements, and then turn around and say, well, you can't access politics because you're illiterate. And we won that struggle. Uh, we won it in the courts, and uh, it was Judge Wisdom's decision in the, the case of U.S. 